My name is Marcia Burke. I was born in St. Thomas in Jamaica in May 1959. I lived in Port Antonio in Jamaica. I grew up in a place called Airmount in Port Antonio and this is living with my grandmother. Um, I can't remember much about my actual parents at the time. It was, um, I just remember just existing amongst other children where, you know, where my grandmother lived. For me at the time, it was like a big, big house on stilts. Um, and then we had an outdoor kitchen and we had a veranda. And from the veranda, we could see Port, the main town, Port Antonio, which had a harbour. And we had cruise ships coming in. And on the other side of us, we had a Rio Grande, which was a river, one of the longest rivers in Jamaica. And they often did rafting there. And that's where my mother originally comes from. So we used to go back to this place called Baradell um, quite often. Um, you know, and I, obviously I didn't really realize what it was at the time, but my mother grew up there and that's where she was from. So she had other family members there that used to look out for us, but we didn't, we sort of took it for granted that everyone knew us and we never really put any emphasis on who people were. They just were, they, they were just there once, you know, we existed. Uh, my grandma was fat and she had heavy hands so she slapped you remember it <laughs> uh she was lovely she was she was funny she was very wholesome i mean you know she did a lot of things well she was a great cook um and yeah she was funny she just used to she you you could have have a good laugh with her she had a great sense of humor and she was very kind and generous and and she yeah she could be very strict as well but um you know in, in all in all everyone really loved her because she uh, there was just something about her she was appeared to be serious but then she just like really had a heart of gold and all the young kids and the teenagers they loved her they always would want to come around her house and just hang out with her. Even if we weren't there, they'd be there hanging with her. And she was just cool. Uh, I think my favorite thing was um, going shopping because she used to go to the market. She used to do a, have a market day, not necessarily every weekend, but she'd go to the market from time to time. And when I did go to the market with her, it's like shopping day. So um, we'd sell in the market, but she would take me shopping to buy me some clothes. I'd go and have my photograph taken, I'd go and have an ice cream, I'd have a patty and snowball and, you know, all these things before I'd get home. And then when we were getting home, we'd bring it home, like patties and cakes and everything for the weekend. And then when we get home, because there's so much people, it's like we're having a party every weekend. You know, there's always food, if it's not fish, the guys, the, the boys, would they would go fishing and they'll come back with their catch. And, you know, my granny would just turn that into something spectacular. We'd have like roast fish and roast yam and things. This is like moonlight, you know, in the moonlight. It's good. The only thing I didn't like, which she used to do religiously, was like, I think the six weeks holiday when we were on holiday, she would make sure we have a washout, which is, means in a laxative. Oh my God, that was, that was, the, I think that was one of my worst memories, laxative. Yeah, we'd get this cup of brew of herbs and everything. I mean, you know, and honestly, that's when I'd disappear and run, I'd be off and they'd make me drink. And then she'd, she, she knew how to get me, she'd have a sweet ready. It's like, yeah, you take that, you get some sweet. It's like, uh, yeah, and then you take this laxative and you, you know, for the whole day, you just cannot go anywhere. Your stomach is coming apart. It's just like, it's coming out and you're, <laughs> you're crying, you're calling her, nanny, help me. <laughs> She's like, oh, don't worry, child, it's all be over. Don't. <laughs>
It's good for you. <laughs> Stop all the worms. Yeah, but um, I mean, there were so many good memories. I, I, I can't even sort of think of one, but yeah, I mean, when we come back from the market, you know, she'd, we'd stop and there was a bar and we'd stop there and have some soup or she'd stand and chat with her friends and always somebody to talk to on the way. I mean, back to the mountains, I mean, I think it might have been about uh, maybe four mile walk or something. But on the way, there would be so many people that we would see before we got home that it didn't really seem like a four mile walk, you know, because we had a lot of distraction on the way. My granddad, he grew bananas and um, coffee and chocolate and, you know, all kind of fruits and vegetables. And he used to plant yams as well. Um, he used to export bananas, well, sell it to the, there was somebody who used to buy it in the town and that was, would be so exported. With that, um, you know, it was quite, it was quite interesting because, um, you know, there was just sort of different aspect of what he does. I mean, when he was exporting, he would have people come to, to help him to cut the bananas and take it to the market, weigh it. I mean, if he had animals, he also had people come in to buy, buy them and then they would um, take them to the market. So he always had something going on. Um, he just used to tell us stories after we had our wash at night and had our, you know, had our dinner and sit on the veranda. And we'd be looking into Port Antonio from there. We'd have a great view of Port Antonio. And, he, you know, it'd be like story times. And every night he'd tell us a story. And they were so terrible. These stories were so scary. You would not want to go toilet. And the toilets were outside at the time and at the, at the back of the house. And no one wanted to go toilet after my granddad tells these stories. He'd tell us these stories about things like rolling calf. He'd tell us about some pirates and, you know, these pirates in these jars that comes up in the, in your, in the night. And, oh my God, you know, it, and dingalos and it, how the chains and you hear it and everything. And with this, we never went out at night. We never go any further than, you know, anywhere that we went. It was somewhere that we could see very clearly and it wasn't too far from home. Because that area, I mean, there was always graveyards and um, graves. Everywhere you look, there was a grave somewhere. And, you know, when he tells you the stories, you swear that you're seeing shadows and you're seeing things <laughs> after these stories you swear that you know you you've seen what you've just described God, i thought i was going to be stepping in to a cinderella kind of scenario i thought there was going to be a white carriage I thought there was going to be like, you know, I thought it was going to be snowing all the time. I thought that England was going to be white. I expected it to be white. I was expecting to kind of live in Buckingham Palace or somewhere like that. I mean, I was really expecting big things. I mean, really. I mean, I thought we really had, you know, like a chauffeur would be, we'd be having a different chauffeur every week. I mean, that sort of... Grandeur was in my head, you know what I'm saying? It was like, yeah, I was like going to England. I mean, I, well, I wasn't excited about coming to England, mind you. I didn't really look at it that way. I knew one day that I was going to go because my granny always sort of said that. But I wasn't ready. And my journey coming to England was, it was a bit off, to be quite honest. And I was disappointed because when I left Jamaica for the airport, I mean, they didn't tell me I was actually coming here. So this was my... Um, this was my um, ticket, which is a BOAC ticket. And um, it sort of shows a, a, passenger, a young passenger traveling alone. Now, I felt I was traveling alone. I know they had aerostess on there to look after me, but I, I didn't feel they didn't, they, they didn't do their job. They might have stopped me from running off or ending up in another country, but I wasn't even aware that they were there looking after me. I mean, it's only when I actually got on the plane, I realised I was coming and my grandmother wasn't coming with me. I didn't mind going on the plane because, of course, it was excited. You want to get on the plane. Mm. But then 
she didn't come through the other door. And I was, you know, that left a bad taste in my mouth. It's like, what the I think the saving grace is because my brother was here. He had left three years before me. So he, he, was, he, was, he was just welcome to see his face or see somebody that I knew. Because I was, I was in shock. I wasn't expecting what, you know, I mean, if they would sort of said to me, you're going, maybe I could have get it in my head and, you know, get used to it. But it wasn't. And because my granny didn't come. I thought she was coming and, and she didn't. I felt betrayed because, you know, she was my constant. So, yeah. I remember when I come from the airport, my mum brought me home. We went home. I think my dad, I can't remember he, what he did. He might have just went to work or did something else. But I remember being with my mum and she was like, OK. She cooked me. Well, I think I must have gotten here really early in the morning, so she cooked me breakfast. And it was like sausage, egg, beans and things. It was disgusting. It was disgusting. And a cup of tea. Oh. It was horrible. It was just like... Oh, it was just like... Oh. Sausage, beans and eggs and... Oh. Oh. I, and I didn't... I, and I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't stomach anything. It's just like, oh, couldn't eat. I mean, and then I was like skinny like nothing. Like, just like, you know, and I just couldn't eat. I just used to throw up every time I smelled tea or... It's... Yeah, so, and my first experience, so, yeah, the house was, it was all, all claustrophobic. It was all very, and dull. And then obviously it was March. Um, so it wasn't really that, it, it, obviously it was warm, it wasn't as bad as winter, but still for me, March was freezing. And then I went to school, um, I think, I, in fact, I think I had mumps or chicken pox the first, second week. I had mumps after a few days of coming here, I had mumps. And then I had chicken pox. Then I had measles or something like that. I was just getting all these germs. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, because I remember my being at home with my dad. It was hell, because it's like, he was like a complete stranger, and I'm in the same house as him for all day. And I didn't know what to say to him. It was like, I didn't know what to call him. I didn't feel comfortable. I couldn't say dad, because I didn't even call my grandfather dad. But to say dad or mum, I didn't know what to say. So there was like, I was finding it very difficult to communicate, because I didn't know what to call them or to get them attention, I just start speaking to them, just so that I didn't have to say mum or dad or, you know, say the wrong thing. And then they were always correcting me as well, because my, my accent or how I spoke, it wasn't English to them. And, oh, you mustn't say this and you mustn't say that. I was like, I better not speak then, because I don't know what I'm supposed to say. And yeah, I was very conscious of the things that what came out of my mouth. Conscious. In fact, I was made to feel conscious of everything because, you know, it's just like all the eyes are on you. Everything you did or said, somebody took note. Um, school was... It was a bit of trying to... It's getting too used to it. I mean, the children, some of the children were real bullies. Um, and I had to literally get into fights, not because I wanted to, but basically to defend myself, because there was a lot of troublesome children in the school. There were quite a few children there that would harass you for no good reason. So... I, I mean, the school, school... I mean, that was mild. It was OK. It was OK for the first few years. Yeah, it was okay. Um, Kensal Rise Junior School, and it was like a mixed school, boy, boys and girls. Um, and I was just in the juniors, and then I went there for t until I was, what, 10, 11? Then I went to Salisbury Road, um, Salisbury Road Junior High, mm -hmm. which was going to be like, not secondary as such, but stage from juniors 
it was like a midway between secondary and juniors. And I went there for, it should have been two years. But then they brought in the comprehensive school and they, that was the last term. So I went to Elstone because that was the next best school. All the other schools around there were like um, grammar schools and girls schools and that. And I would have most probably go to one of those schools. But then due to the comprehensive and Elstone was one of the biggest comprehensive around and it was a new thing everyone sort of gravitated towards the comprehensive thinking it was a good thing I'm not so sure um, it was it was too big and we didn't get we didn't get the, the attention that we needed we were just thrown in the deep end I think because with the comprehensive Everything was moving so fast. They didn't really think about the children. They, you, you know, you just had to fit into a box. It wasn't really, and every the decision was made. You didn't have a part. You know, it's like pre-planning made on your behalf. You didn't have nothing to do with it. You sort of just had to follow through. Only when you came out of it, you sort of look back and think, yeah, well, that wasn't really such a good idea. I, even, but even when I was going there, I didn't feel I was getting anything. I was getting anything or, you know, there was any point. My parents didn't tell me anything about racism. They didn't have an issue, you know, there wasn't that, we didn't have that sort of conversation at home. And, and I didn't have, I mean, I didn't have, I mean, it was, say, white people at the time, but I didn't have any preconceived ideas about white people, if you understand what I'm saying. I didn't, my, my parents didn't say, oh, don't trust those people because they're... I didn't, I mean, I find they, they, were, they were gentle. They were, you know, they spoke softer than we did. And to be quite honest, I think I, I suffered more with, I mean, I never got into a fight with a white person. I mean, no white person was waiting for me after school to beat me up. It's always the black kids, so I don't, I don't, it's the black kids that was beating me up or trying to beat me up. So that, so that wasn't it. But then I noticed that obviously it's the teachers and how the classes were set out. We, but it wasn't something that we could have controlled. But obviously we were placed in a situation where obviously, you know, as if you don't notice, because obviously how the classes were set up you see that the black kids were put in one class and the white kids were put in another class. So, you know, it was like, yeah. And the, what they were taught, we weren't taught the same thing. They had a different, they had, what they were taught, when you looked at their blackboards, it's like they've been taught something. When you look at your blackboard, you think, what the hell? You didn't get, I didn't, in my class, they didn't give us homework. And you're thinking, why, why, why didn't we get homework? Or, or but there was nothing to stimulate. It was just like a re, re, you know repetition of things and things that was irrelevant and you knew it was irrelevant. You think, well, what what is all this about? You were learning things that you you thinking, but this should be for a five year old. Why are you teaching me this? You know, like things that you knew already. You're thinking, so when you did get something that was uh, maybe challenging, you, you're not engaged anymore because you're just so fed up of waiting for them to really teach you something. Um, you don't know what it is you're supposed to be taught, but you know that whatever they're giving you is not really supposed to be, this is not relevant and this is not going to take you nowhere. This, and you don't get it. It, does not, it doesn't make any sense. It's not anything that you can even repeat or something that you're going to benefit from. Even at an early age, I knew that. The white children that were in my class were children that, it's like they either write their parents off or write these children off. So you can see the children that was in your class. I mean, not everybody, but you can see, you know, what was there, it was clear. Well, my, my, my teenage, Years was, um, I mean, I was just looking to have fun and enjoy my life. Um, I used to have a lot of friends and I used to go, we, we, the main thing we used to go partying. 
We used to go to clubs as teenagers. We, well, in fact, we started off going to youth centres. We didn't call it clubs at the time. We had youth centres. And at these youth centres, um, I wasn't really allowed to go to, to clubs or youth centre as such. So I had to join the Girl Guides. And when I joined the Girl Guides, that gave me licence to flit to places that I wasn't supposed to go. I mean, it's surprising how I used to use the library as an excuse. I'm going to the library, and the library closed really early when I'm thinking, God, that didn't really give me much time to play with. And um, yeah, and I left home at, uh, when I was, what, 16? And I rented a flat in Kensal Rise, in fact, on Oakhampton Road, same place as my school. My, some of my school friends were still going to school. They'd come by for lunch. And yeah, I'd cook lunch for them. They'd come by for lunch. And I would be, I'd be going to, I was going to a college in um, uh, Brent. In, in Brent, yeah. But the, my teenage years after that, Mm, it was it was a bit of um, a sort of dark times because you're sort of growing up now and you've got to really make decisions and then when you 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 try to follow up on the things that it was just, just wasn't happening you've left school now and you haven't got school to hold on to and nothing really is going on so yeah that there was a bit of a flat period where nothing was happening and we just sort of um, we just sort of, sort of ride it through, I think, till the next year and I got myself a part-time job. No, I was working for this shoe shop in the West End, Freeman Hardly Willis, as a sales assistant. And it was in the West End, so it was all right, you know. Um, again, we had, um, there was a manager and yeah, this is when you, you, you kind of know then when people are not playing fair, you know, saying. And then I started seeing how people behave in, in a negative way towards... Then, but they didn't say anything. They just did things that they didn't do to everybody else. And you, you realise that. So I mean, they wouldn't speak to you. I mean, they wouldn't really ask you how your day is. I mean, how... You know, and the small talk, what they'll do with anybody else and the jokes that you're not included in it. So you, you know, you, it's, it's kind of subtle things. It's not sort of something that you, you could even make a fuss about and say, well, oh, this didn't, this happen. If somebody says something direct or do something, then you can, you can call it out. But you can't when they did, haven't actually done, done anything. Um, but then my colleagues, I got on well with the people I worked with. They were, they were, you know, they were okay. Um, and then, you know, I had I an ambition. What did I want to do? I wanted to be a hero stess as well. But because I left home at an early age, a lot of stuff that I wanted to do, I had to get parental permission to do it. And of course, I'm too stubborn to go and ask for anything, aren't I? So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know. The first time I went back, it was uh, it was a culture shock. It was a it was a big shock. I loved it and hated it at the same time. And it took me a few times to go back to really love it. And like, the more I go, is the more I love it. It's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, you know, you can have a love-hate relationship sometimes because it's full on when you get there. But if you, once you get over certain things, and it's okay. And my worst thing is actually having to stay with anybody. If I don't have to stay with anybody, then I have a great time. But before, it was like, it was unheard of to sort of just go to Jamaica and stay in a hotel. You had to go and stay with family. You stay with family, oh boy, oh, that's, that's it. They make your life such a misery at times. Mm. Yeah, but I've learned to sort of cope with that and, you know, and know how to manoeuvre when I'm out there now. So I have a good, good time when I go. I would just say, really, be yourself. 
don't give up. Don't, no one's better than you. No, you know, everything comes back around. If you're, if you're black, it comes in fashion. If you're tall, it comes back in fashion. If you're skinny, it comes in fashion. If you're fat, it comes in fashion. Don't give up, don't worry about anybody else, you know, because you just have to just be yourself because that's really what matters at the end of the day. You just really be yourself. Be, you know, find yourself first before you try to be like anybody. Don't try to be like anybody else. You can admire them, but you are, will, and you will always be you. You can only be the best of yourself. You can't be the best of anybody else. And if I had gotten that advice, I think, then maybe things would have changed. I wouldn't have been struggling with myself or beating myself up about certain things or have certain insecurity. I didn't sort of wear my insecurity on my sleeves, but in my inner, you know, I mean, I might not have shared that with anybody, say, so well, I'm not confident about that. But in my own inside, I would be shaken up about certain things or I'd be very insecure about certain things. And yeah, if so, if I could tell anyone, it's really, really be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. You know, you have what it takes. Because I used to think, oh, this person is better than me and everybody's better than me. And nobody's better than you because you just don't know what you can do until you do it. Mm -hmm. And if you've never had the opportunity to do something, you can't be as good as somebody else if you've never been exposed to that. So, you know, and all you do don't, give up you just keep trying and you really are uh, you 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 know you only got yourself to rely on at the end of the day and yeah you you you're not that bad <laughs> that's all i can say really and you know just just have some just just believe in yourself just take just know that you're worthy you're just as good as anybody else Thank you.